November 1982 at Kennedy Space Center's Launch Pad 39A. Columbia is being readied for its fifth orbital mission, which will also be the first operational flight for America's space shuttle. In the rotating service structure's white room, two satellites, SBS-3 and Annex C-3, are being loaded vertically in Columbia's cargo bay. Everything is done under clean room conditions as the payload ground handling mechanism installs the satellites with precise care. Each satellite is mounted aboard a PAM or payload assist module. The thrust of the PAM motor will propel the satellite to a high point in its orbit of about 22,300 miles. Then at that point, a solid fuel motor on the spacecraft will be fired to circularize its orbit at a point stationary above the Earth. Cargo buttoned up, the rotating service structure rolls back. Final pre launch processing continues with thorough checks of all systems before the final countdown begins. In the launch control center, every system, every function, every item is checked and double checked. November 11th, T minus three and a half hours. Commander Vance Brand, Pilot Bob Overmeyer, and the two mission specialists, Doctors Bill Lenore and Joe Allen, have their pre-launch breakfast before heading out to the pad. This will be the first mission to carry a four-man crew into space. dawn darkness, the launch pad appears like a scene from some other planet, alive with activities and structures unfamiliar to most of us in this world. From the white room high above, the crew begins boarding Columbia through the crew compartment hatch. It's T minus one hour and 55 minutes. On and around the space center, Several hundred thousand visitors are waiting to watch Columbia begin its fifth mission. Cameras and microphones of the world press are on the job at the press site near the launch control center. A number of distinguished visitors, dignitaries, and VIPs were also on hand. Here's former Secretary of Defense Melvin Laird, renewing old acquaintances. In the last seconds of countdown, all eyes turn to watch for the erupting flames to signal Columbia's rise toward space. Right on schedule at 7.19 a.m., Columbia's three main engines ignited, shown here in ultra-slow motion, with their liquid fuel producing an all but invisible flame. Just as the liquid-fueled main engines reach full power, the solid rocket boosters ignite, adding five million pounds of thrust to lift Columbia skyward. These views were filmed at 400 frames per second, or about 17 times faster than our normal filming speed of 24 frames per second. Satellite transmission of TV and radio coverage enabled people everywhere in the world to follow the action as Columbia blazed heavenward on a thundering column of flame. At two minutes into the mission and 23 miles from Pad 39, the gigantic solid rocket boosters had done their job. Explosive bolts released the boosters and small but powerful thrusters separated them from the external tank in Columbia. For the first time, the deployment of the SRB parachutes was photographed. A chase plane carried a special camera with a telescopic lens to record the sequence of events. On signal from a barometric pressure switch, the nose cone ejected, pulling with it the tiny pilot chute. As it caught the air, the pilot deployed the larger drogue chute, 
which then brought out the three main parachutes, each 115 feet in diameter. At splashdown, the speed of the boosters had been slowed from 2,900 miles an hour to an impact velocity of about 60 miles an hour. Air trapped in the forward end of boosters kept them afloat while the recovery ship's Freedom and Liberty prepared for towing them back to land. The crew had this view of Earth against the darkness of space after the cargo bay doors were open. SPS-3 was launched about eight hours into the flight. Just before deployment, the spacecraft is spun up to as much as 100 RPMs for stability in flight. Telsat Canada's Annex C-3, launched on the second day, is the first of a trio of spacecraft designed to provide domestic communication services for our Canadian friends. The physical condition of the crew in a weightless environment was monitored for evaluation, including regular exercise periods and planned experiments. Scheduled EVA or extravehicular activity had to be scrubbed because of spacesuit malfunctions. Meals in space combined nutrition with experimentation in different ways to consume the food. halfway around the world above the Indian Ocean. Re-entry will commence over the Western Pacific with transition to aerodynamic controls during the long glide to a landing at Edwards Air Force Base in California's Mojave Desert. Dropping below 10,000 feet, Commander Vance Brand is lining up on the concrete runway below. The first operational shuttle mission has been a success despite postponement of the EVA to a later flight. In the meantime, both satellites have been lifted to higher orbit by their payload assist modules, then placed in their assigned locations in stationary orbits. After modifications at Kennedy Space Center, Columbia's next flight will be STS-9. Then an international crew of six will fly a research mission carrying the European-built Space Lab. John Young, who commanded the first shuttle mission, will be in command once more when Columbia flies again. Columbia, one journey's end became the beginning of another. Aboard a specially reinforced 747, the orbiter was ferried back to Kennedy Space Center. STS-5's mission is accomplished. Perhaps the crew best expressed the success of this first operational mission. We deliver. <laughs>